Hello everyone, my name is Iris Franz. Today we are going to talk about the absence in the labor market. In particular, I'm using Hall Barrier's Intermediate Microeconomic Book. And uh, this part is page 513 to page 514. I am going to show you mathematically how if you are working for a monopsony, then you are going to be paid a wage that is lower than the value you provide for the company. So what is a monopsony? Monopsony is the only buyer in the labor market. So you ask, how can this be possible? I am going to use the example of XPO at the Memphis, Tennessee. So according to a report of the uh, New York Times, um, if you are um, located at that area, it is Memphis, and if you are without a college degree, you are unskilled labor, then if you want to work for a warehouse, you have to uh, work for XPO, because XPO owns all the three warehouses at the east side of Memphis. One um, handles products of Disney, another one for Nike, and the other one for Verizon. So if you are without a college degree and you want to work for a warehouse, XPO is the company that will hire you, and that's the only company that will provide you a warehouse job over there. So you can imagine, in that case, the company is on the upper hand, and they're really able to suppress your wage. And according to New York Times, a lot of women, they work there um, during their pregnancy, and even though the doctor asks women not to do any heavy lifting, this doctor's notes are ignored by the supervisors at XPO, which result um, a lot of miscarriages of this woman and also one woman had to go through a premature birth and she had to watch her baby die within 10 minutes. So you can imagine if you're working for uh, monopsony, they are really able to suppress your wage. So um, going back to our mathematics, so suppose you are this uh, monopsony and you have a production function. So um, why is your output? So for example, that would be the number of package service you provide for, say, Verizon, or you provide for Disney, something like that. And uh, Y, that's the output, is a function of X. So X is the number of workers you hire. And you, as a monopsony, you're a monopsony in the labor market. But the product or your service you provide um, is competitive. So you are a price taker in the output market. So for example, um, Packing a package, um, the price of packing a package, say, is $1. So for each package you pack for Disney or for Verizon, you can charge Verizon, say, $1. And that price is given, and you have no say about that. So your revenue will be equal to price of the packaging service you charge, which is given, times the number of package that service you provide, so P times Y. And remember, y is a function of x, x is the number of workers you hired. So your revenue will be p times y, which is also equal to p times f of x. So that will be your revenue. What about your cost? Um, suppose you only hire workers and there are no other costs. Just to simplify that. So um, now, in the labor market, you are a price maker because you are the only um, buyer in the labor market, say XPO in, in the east side of Memphis. So in that case, you are facing the labor supply curve by yourself. So you don't take the wage as given. In fact, the more workers you hire, the higher wage you have to pay because the supply curve is positively sloped. And when you hire more workers, you have to increase the wage. Not just the wage for the additional worker, but also the wage for every worker. And therefore, your wage is a function of the number of laborers you hire, and there is a positive correlation between the two. So your total cost will be equal to your wage times the number of workers you hire, so that will be W times X. And don't forget that W is a function of X. So your cost is equal to W of X times X. Now we're going to maximize our profit, because that's what firms do. So your profit is equal to revenue minus cost. So that's a profit function, a function pi of x. That's equal to your revenue, which is p times f of x, minus your cost, w of x times x. And now we're going to take the derivative of this profit function with respect to x, set it equal to 0. So 
what do you get if you take derivative of that? So P is given because we know that in the product market we're competitive, so we take the price as given. And we take the derivative of this production function, so f of x. Notice that when you take the derivative of the production function, you get the marginal product labor. So just an example, if your um, production function y is equal to f of x, which is equal to 30 times x, that means in, say, each hour, each worker is going to pack 30 packs for you, 30 packages. And if you take the derivative of that, which is back to x, then you will get the productivity of the worker. So that will be 30. That means the number of um, packages they can pack, that will be 30. So you know that f of x really is the marginal product of labor. And now we're going to take the derivative of this total cost and um, with respect to x. So you have to use the product rule. And taking the derivative of that, you get wx plus w prime x times x. That's just a product rule. And that is equal to zero because we want to maximize our profit. And then um, next, I'm going to move this term to the right hand side. I didn't change anything here. So p times f of x is equal to wx plus w prime x times x. So I didn't change anything, I'm just moving that to the right hand side of the equation. And the next step, I'm going to take out wx, and inside the bracket we get 1 plus w prime x times x divided by wx, because I'm pulling that out. So what do I get here? Eventually I get 1 plus, what is w prime x? That's just dw dx and x over w. And notice that later on I will show you this term really is the reciprocal of the labor elasticity of supply. I'm going to show you later. But for now, you know, the left hand side is price times the uh, marginal product of labor. So that gives you the value the workers bring to the company. Why is that? So you can see that f prime x is the productivity of this worker. Multiply that by the price the company can charge for the service. So for example, if in each hour, each worker can provide, um, can pack 30 packages. And for each package, XPO say if they can charge Verizon $1 for each package service they provide, then um, the value this worker provide will be 30 packages times $1, that will be $30. So that will be the value the worker provides to the company. We also call the MRP marginal revenue product. So that's a value this worker provides the company. On the right hand side, you see that's the wage times one plus the reciprocal of elasticity of supply, elasticity of labor supply. So this thing is going to be greater than one. And therefore, wage times something greater than one is going to be greater than your wage. Therefore, you can see that the value you provide to the company is going to be higher than your wage. And that is very um, straightforward because you can imagine that if you are working for a monopsony, they are not going to um, pay you the value you provide for the company. They are going to try to suppress your wage. Now going back to elasticity of labor supply, we know that elasticity is equal to dq dp times p over q. And now we're going to change the notation to the notation we get from variance textbook. So dq dp is just dx dw. So x is the um, number of workers, so the quantity of workers. And the price you pay for the worker really is just their wage. And you can see that's elasticity. And you take the reciprocal of that, that's exactly this term. So I have mathematically proven how if you work for a monopsony, then you are going to be paid a wage that is lower than the value you provide for the company. And um, this wage can include, for example, the cost of miscarrying your baby, the cost of premature births, and the death of your babies. So I hope this helps, and I'll see you next time.